message for today, a little bit intriguing, so I want you to follow along with me and, and as we unpack this, but the title is A High Priest for Maturity. A High Priest for Maturity. That's what you and I need. And that's the reason why we need him. We need a high priest to impart us, to help us in order to achieve maturity in the Lord. We need to understand his ministry. And we're going to be here for probably two, maybe three weeks because Hebrews has a lot to say about Yeshua as the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So we're going to uh, get it started today. Next week we'll tackle Mel uh, Melchizedek uh, fully uh, and understand what that, what that is all about. So in Hebrews 4, 14, beginning in verse 14, we read, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Yeshua, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, our confession of faith, our initial uh, statement of, of belief in him. Verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us, uh, with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have such a great high priest. So let me tell you then the ways in which he is great. That's really what the author is saying. So he, dive, he dives right in. Number one, the first thing he says is that he is a high priest who has passed through the heavens. This is, a, this is a reference to his ascension. You remember, he gathered the disciples at the very last uh, day. Uh, in fact, this was during the counting of the Omer, the time between the resurrection and Shavuot. He was with them for 40 days, and he told them, wait a little longer for the gift that the Father is going to send. Ten days later, they received the baptism uh, of the Holy Spirit on Shavuot, on Pentecost. So on the 40th day is the day when he ascended into heaven in their uh, very view, uh, right before their eyes. He went up in the clouds. And so it says here that he passed through the heavens. In Ephesians 4.10, uh, we read that it says that he who descended in his incarnation is himself also he who ascended in his exaltation far above all heavens. Far above all heavens. And look what it, what it says. So that he might fill all things. So that he might fill all things. Everything was created for him and through him. And he fills all in all. Amazing. He is the high priest who ascended above all the heavens. But what does it exactly mean? What does that exactly mean? Well, in the book of Hebrews, we have been studying and seeing that the, uh, the author has several ways to refer to heaven, what we, what we call heaven. And one of those ways is the world to come, the world to come. The reality in which God lives, in which all things have already been uh, finished, accomplished, done. He has entered his rest. The, the word used here 
uh, that he has passed through. He has passed through the heavens, going back to uh, Hebrews 4, uh, 14. I got a little curious, and I said, I want to know how is this word translated into Hebrew? Hebrews translated into Hebrew, because you know that this was actually written in Greek. So if you are an Israeli and Hebrew is your first language, you need a translation because you don't read Greek, right? And English, you know, you may know a lot of English, but that's not your first language. You need the, co the New Covenant scriptures. You need them in Hebrew. Now, that's a wonderful job to be able to translate the scriptures into Hebrew because, see, you have a lot of background a lot of words to choose from, from the Tanakh, right, from the Hebrew Bible. So one translator about 100 years ago, he took that task, and he did a wonderful job. Uh, his, translator, his translation needed a little updating because when he, you know, when he did this translation, uh, uh, they didn't have airplanes, televisions, internet, things like that. And I know it. We don't talk about that in the Bible, of course. But Israelis have a language that has, because it has come back to life, now it's a, it's a language that's dynamic and it changes. And, and uh, that has happened, actually. So we, they have needed translations that are a little more apt to date, you know, with how Israelis speak today. But this translation that was done uh, a little over 100 years ago is still very good. Because this translator took it upon himself and, and his group to use uh, as much as possible, use the same words from the Tanakh, from the Hebrew Bible. So you have some really interesting things. So I wanted to see what word did they use for this little word here that he passed through the heavens. He passed through. So I went back to uh, the, the New Covenant Scriptures in Hebrew. Uh, found Hebrews 4.14, and I found out that the word that is used here for pass through, a bar, a bar, is the regular word that you would use to cross the Jordan, to go across, to pass through, to go across. And that fits the context here, because you see, when Yeshua ascended into heaven, he entered his rest. His work was finished. He entered into the promised land. So his ascension, in a way, can be described, can be illustrated as Israel crossing in, to, to take possession of the land. And that image is important because he is taking us with him. When he goes and passes through and enters into the promise of God, the fulfillment of the promises of God, you went there with him too because you are in him. That's the reason why you are seated in the heavenly places with Messiah. When he passed through the heavens, when he crossed into the promises of God, we went with him also. So he ministers from that position. He, he is a high priest. He's, it says that he is Yeshua, the Son of God, going back to verse 14, Hebrews 4, 14. Yeshua, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. This makes it easier. This is great encouragement to hold fast uh, for the Hebrews in the middle of their trials, persecutions, uh, temptations, to persevere in their faith in Messiah. Verse 15, it says, For, he continues to explain now, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. You know, this word sympathize, it's actually literally taken from the Greek. In the Greek, it says, sympatheo, sympatheo, 
sympathize. And we, we do a lot in, in, in English, you know, people trying to explain to you, well, you know, there's a difference between sympathy and empathy and all of that. But I was like, okay, I'm going to cut through all of that. I'm going to go straight to what is this actually saying? You know, what is, what is this word? Because these are actually two words combined. The word sim, S-I-M, is actually S-U-N. It changes a little bit in context. And it means together or with. Together or with. And the, the other one, the, the rest of the word pateo or uh, it comes from the word pasco, pasco, means to experience or to suffer. He is the high priest that suffers with you, that suffers together with you. He can sit with you through your weakness. And the reason is that he himself went through a lot of suffering. Let's take a look. Um, Hebrews 2.10. Hebrews 2.10. It says, For it was fitting for him for whom all things, for whom are all things, this is God, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, you and me, many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting for God to perfect the author of their salvation, speaking of Yeshua, right? Their salvation refers to us. The author is Yeshua. So it was fitting for God to take Yeshua, who is the author of our salvation, and it says to perfect him through suffering. It was fitting for God to perfect him. Well, number one, you've heard me say it several times now, that the concept of perfection is a Greek idea. The Hebraic idea is completeness. Completeness. It was fitting for God to bring Yeshua to, to, to be more complete, like did it lack something? Isn't he God? What, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, I'm going to say it again because we, we talked about this uh, two or three weeks ago, but I know it's a difficult concept, and many people trip over this. We're going to talk a little bit about handling the Word of God uh, uh, towards the end of our message. But this has the idea of, of him in his humanity, in his incarnation, he had, he, he, he had the need to experience suffering. Now, don't get me wrong. God has experienced a lot of suffering watching his children <laughs> kill each other <laughs> and be so mean to each other, right? You know, you're a parent and you watch your children not get along and fight, and it's, it's really tough. You suffer a lot through this. But it's not the same, and God took it upon, upon himself to become a man, to go undergo suffering so that he could be the high priest that can sit with you and with me to suffer with. To suffer with. It is in that sense that he is even more complete. As being God, he is even more complete because he has experienced what humanity experiences. The thought is just amazing. But don't let go of the tension. You see, sometimes people are... Uh, I'm going to say it, okay? In their immaturity, in their theological immaturity, they feel the need to resolve tension. And we're not supposed to. We're supposed to live with the tension that he is God, 
and yet he needed to be made to be made more complete not because he lacked anything in his deity but be rather in his humanity he needed to undergo suffering to identify with us to be able to minister to us isn't that amazing I uh, listened to uh, in our class this week we had a guest speaker who lives up in Colorado as a pastor in Colorado and in his town the, the school board passed one of these, you've heard it, you know, critical theory, uh, all of these things that are going on around the, the nation uh, these days. So he was having a meeting and he was addressing this, this issue. And there was a lady in the meeting who stood up, told him off, and walked off. And he was like, Whoop, wait, 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 let's talk about this. And so they began to talk about it. And it turns out, so he, he, he asked the lady, um, have you ever experienced discrimination as a white person? And she said, nope. But she's making sure, which is a novel idea, right? She's making sure that no one experiences discrimination. Her mistake was to accuse him without knowing him, right, of having no idea, having no compassion uh, for people who do suffer discrimination. And he said, well, I, I grew up when, in the time when schools were brought together. And they, he was one of those kids that were bused through the other uh, part of town and had to go and sit in a, in a classroom with people that, were, that looked different than him. He, he lived through that. And, and he asked her, have you lived through that? And she said, no. Okay. And he said, have you been passed over on a race or actually your wages have been reduced, your salary has been reduced in order to make room for minorities and to, to level, the lev uh, level up the, the, the level of compensation for them. And she said, nope. What if that were to happen to you? What if they would take 30% of your salary? I will be tough for my budget. Well, I went through that, said he. So he proceeded to tell her, you know, two, three ways in which she had no experience, never lived through any of it, yet he, she was dictating to the whole community how things should be. And yet accusing him of having no clue and not caring about it. And the thing that he had to say was, you know, there are many of us who have come a long ways. Do we still have a long ways to go? Yes, we do. But there are many who have come a long ways. And it, is, it, it does not set well when none of that is taken into account and it is thrown out like you don't know and you don't care. And I thought that was a great perspective. Someone passing policies for the community without any experience, without any real investment, and yet dictating to at least some in the community that have really gone through it and are not trying to impose their views. I say this because as Yeshua as God, as a divinity, cannot be accused of something like that. He cannot be accused of being too transcendent. 
to out of our realm of suffering and difficulties living with sin in this world. Not only the sin that we commit, but just the choices that we all collectively make. He did. He did. And it was necessary for him to do so. That's, that's amazing. It speaks of God's humility. Sacrifice. Imagine bearing upon himself all the sin, having that in, in his mind. I think that's what brought him to suffering, to even cry out, is there any other way? Just the, the thought, you know, when we hear the news of awful things, uh, many of those videos that came out a few years ago in the Middle East of people being burned alive, I couldn't watch those. I never watched any of those. People being beheaded. I never, I was, I, I never could watch any of those. Imagine if you're forced to watch that, forced to watch all of the atrocities that we have all committed throughout humanity's history. All of that was upon Yeshua. The weight of all of that, we cannot comprehend. That is the price of our salvation, of our redemption from our sin and our fallen nature. He did it for us. He's our high priest. So yes, he can come alongside and suffer with he can sympathize. He can sympathize with our weaknesses. So we do not have, Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize. When we sit in suffering, he understands. He understands. And you know, suffering means to experience pain because of of grief. So think about that for a moment. Suffering means to experience pain because of grief. So the thing we're actually talking about is the grief. The suffering, the pain is because of the grief. Because of the loss, we, we grieve the loss. When you, when you think about that, a lot of the things that cause us suffering and grief and pain, they have to do with loss, whether, it, whether it's real or perceived, whether it's material or relational um, or just things the whole value to us. They have to do with loss. So our grief, so many, in so many instances, comes from loss. So what would it be like for our high priest to be able to come alongside and suffer with? What what how, how, what was the practical translation of that? What does that mean in practical terms? Well, I think, again, we can look at what he did um, with his own suffering to understand what he wants to do for us and to us and with us. Because, you see, what he did was to he, he processed his loss. He processed his grief in a proactive, healthy, and life-giving way. That's what he did. And that's what he wants to help us with. He wants to help us, he wants to sit with us, to, with us, 
help us process our sense of loss in ways that are healthy. He wants to help us process the grief in ways that are life-giving, not death-ministering. You see, when we process loss and grief in ways that are not healthy, we, we, we cause damage to ourselves. We make it worse. We, instead of giving life, we do the opposite, and we begin with, our, with ourselves. Uh, oftentimes, I, I realize, and I say this, that if we were to say to someone else the things we tell ourselves, the way we speak to ourselves, the way we verbally abuse ourselves, if we were to do that to someone else, we could be sitting in jail right now. <laughs> you know, sometimes, uh, most times, we are our very first victim and target. And we behave in ways that are damaging, even to ourselves. So he wants to help us process our loss and our grief in ways that are life-giving. And that includes others. How do we respond uh, out of my own circumstances? How, how do we respond to others? You know, I have to drive to Dallas three times a week. And, and I have to deal with all of them people on the road who do not understand that I'm running late <laughs> for very good reason. You know, I had to work on my homework early. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm running late. Um, uh, you know, it's, I, I, I made the decision, you know, when they cut in front of me, uh, it's like I have this incredible power to erase my own memories that I just did it to the guy that's behind me. <laughs> but somehow it's so upsetting when he does, when the other guy does it to me. And so I've decided to process my own loss <laughs> in healthy ways. So, you know, I slow down and let the guy come in. You know, it's, it's what we do. We're going to go ahead and cut in front right before the exit, and that's okay. It's going to be okay. Even if I'm late, it, it's going to be okay. You know, because some, sometimes our loss is just perceived. We are, we're acting out of fear. It's like the world is not going to end. Your identity is not in jeopardy. Um, you're just fine. This loss, it's not real. And even if it were real, you are complete in Him. So what you think you lose, you, you don't really lose what is core to who you are. You may lose time. Somebody may change their opinion of you because you are late. Um, if you've been around me any length of time, you know I forget things. I forget things. I forget things. I forgot your email and your text. <laughs> And almost every one of you can say, oh, yeah, you, you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I don't justify it. I, I apologize. And I, I'm not afraid that you're going to think less of me. 
Um, and if you do, that would be a great opportunity for us to sit down and, and minister to each other, right? <laughs> because we, we are complete. Martha and Mary, they came to Yeshua and they said, you were late. And we suffered tremendous loss. Death. Somebody died because you were, you were late. Wow, I've never done that bad. <laughs> whoa, Yeshua. Yeah, I mean, whoa. <laughs> no big deal. I can, I can restore, he said, right? I can bring back to life whatever loss. And through, through the fact that you underwent that loss, you're going to have an amazing experience of resurrection. You will forever be transformed and changed. That's what he does to our loss. He sits with us. He suffers with us. He helps us process our loss. And in the end, it brings even more glory even more glory than if everything were to go hunky-dory. Let's go to uh, chapter 5 of Hebrews. I want to jump a little bit here. I'm going to jump to verse 7. So Hebrews 5, 7, it says, Here's a a little, a little bit more into his sufferings. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard. Uh, you're like, no, he wasn't. <laughs> he still died. Well, what do you mean God heard him? Well, God heard him. He didn't stop the suffering. He didn't stop the death. In fact, he defeated death by his death. The loss that he suffered, God redeemed him in the most incredible way that we have seen in the universe. He brought death and finished it by his own suffering. Amazing. He was heard that God knew what was best for him, that the suffering was necessary, and he, he had something better, something better. So he answered the prayer with something even better. I got one better than what you're asking for, son. And he delivers that which is better. So, verse 9, uh, verse 8. Although he was a son, deity, he learned obedience. Right? He learned obedience. That's what we read in, we read in Hebrews 2. He learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Same word. Same word used in sympathy. He can sympathize. He can suffer with. Same word. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered. But I want to talk about this word obedience. Obedience is such a, a word that it's like we've, we, we so not like it that we, it's like we don't hear that word. It's like but, but I want to dive a little bit into it so you appreciate what this word is. See, in, he, in the Greek, it's hupo akuo, two words coming together. From akuo, we get acoustic, right? Things that are heard sound. So it has the idea of to hear. Hupo means to be under, to be submitted. You are under authority. So obedience is being submitted to what you hear. Submitted to what you hear. 
oh, we can hear just fine. The problem is the submitting to it. <laughs> we can hear just fine. I know when the Lord says, you're done eating. No, I'm not. This is your last bite. But, but I don't want to submit. <laughs> I don't believe you, God. I need more. No, this is enough for you. No. <laughs> we don't have a problem hearing. The problem is submitting. Whoa. You see, that's obedience. When we hear and we submit to what we hear. So he learned this. He didn't have a problem with the obedience, uh, with, with, the, with the submission part. Yet, he had to submit his will to the Father's will. And he said, not my will, but yours. He submitted himself to what he heard from the Father. That's how he learned obedience. Not that he ever struggled with it like we do. But it was in the context of this kind of suffering that was, that was added to him. He learned obedience from the things he suffered. Verse 9, and having been made perfect. Okay, now you know this word, right? Perfect means complete, completeness. He was made complete. He became to all those who obey him, that's you and me, to all those, all those of us who hear and submit to what he says, he became the source of eternal salvation. See, we are saved because we hear the, wo the voice of God saying, son, daughter, you are a sinner. Are you going to submit to that? Yes. There's only one name under heaven through which you can be saved. That's my word. Are you going to submit to what I say? Absolutely. There's only one name. All right. You're in. See, faith comes by hearing. By hearing and submitting to what he says. That's not works. That is responding to God's revelation. He speaks, you hear, you say, yes, sir. That's faith. Saving faith. But what's amazing is I got a little curious again, you know, when I get curious, uh, nerdy things happen. <laughs> so I said, I wonder what the word, in, again, in the New Testament, New, New Covenant Scriptures in Hebrew, I wonder what the word for perfect is. You know, because I say so much about this word, and I was like, it's about time that I figure out what the Hebrew word is behind this. So I went to the New Testament in Hebrew, and guess what I found? The word for being made perfect here, for perfection, is the word shalem. Does that sound familiar? Shalom, shalem. Actually, shalom comes from shalem. Does that, does that word mean peace? means a whole lot more than peace. You see, it, it, that word means, shalem means to be complete. To be complete. So the Hebrew and the Greek are saying exactly the same thing. The, the Greek word means to be made complete, to be made mature. And that's what shalem means. You have peace when you understand that you are complete in him, that you lack nothing. So you can drive with shalom. I am complete. I lack nothing. 
You cut in front of me, I didn't lose anything. In fact, I'm going to make sure that you are safe and that I am safe. <laughs> he was made complete. And that's what he wants to do with us. Um, he becomes the source of our salvation. Verse 10, it says, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So we're going to get into Melchizedek next week. But verse 11 says, concerning him, Melchizedek, we have much to say. And it is hard to explain, not because the subject matter is hard, but because you have become dull of hearing. Uh-oh, remember? Submitting to what you hear? Yeah, guys, you have a submitting problem. Because you don't submit to what the teaching that you hear. I can't teach you new things. I can't go in-depth with you. Verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers... You have need, again, for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes, it says here, only of milk, but it, the word only is not actually in the original. For anyone who partakes of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. For he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature. Guess what the word is here? Yeah, that's where we're translated perfect, perfection, shalem, complete. Yeah. Solid food is for the mature. Who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Wow, we could go another hour just on this verse. All right, I'm not going to. Nobody got excited about that. So. <laughs> we'll go to Oneg then. <laughs> just real quick. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 11. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. This, this word infant. It says... 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was an infant, same, same word, I used to speak like an infant, think like an infant, reason like an infant. When I became a man, an adult, I did away with infant things. Same word, all of those times. So the one who is an infant is one who is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, who needs milk, who is not ready for solid food, who does not practice in being, uh, and is not trained in discerning good and evil. Discerning good and evil. The best way to understand good and evil is to go to Genesis. Genesis 1. And God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was very good. And then he put the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, don't eat of it. The source to tell you what is good and what is evil is me. But I need to test you to see if you are going to Take it upon yourself to decide for yourself what is good and evil. If you're going to try to figure this out away from me and apart from me. Because you need to depend on me. You see, good is that which is fruitful. All throughout Genesis 1, he makes a fruitful land because everything that he creates in each day of creation contributes to making the land fruitful. So good is that which makes you and me 
fruitful. You and me are the land. The seed, the word of God, he says in Matthew 13, the seed goes into the heart of the man, of the person. Because we are the land. So the creation of the land in Genesis 1 is actually, uh, it, it actually speaks of how we are made fruitful as people. All the principles are there. So to be an infant is to not know, to not be able to discern what makes me fruitful and what doesn't. So I make decisions that do not make me fruitful because I cannot discern. And the reason I cannot discern whether this is fruitful for me or not is because I am still an infant. Because I'm dull of hearing. Because I'm not submitting to what he has said. To what I understand today. So that's where the process starts. I want to be mature. Okay. Submit to what you know today. When you submit and you keep submitting and he says more and you keep submitting to that, you grow through your suffering. You become mature through your suffering. He helps you process your loss your grief, your pain, and you're made better, you're made mature, more complete by it, and you keep submitting to the word, all of a sudden, now you understand Melchizedek. And now you understand solid food. And now your senses are being trained to discern what makes you fruitful. And you can make decisions on the spot. And you can be kind, and people wouldn't even ever even find out why you went there or didn't, why you said this word, what word you never even said, why you decided to walk away from that conversation at that time. You discern, this is not fruitful for me. This is not fruitful for me. This is fruitful for me. You are trained. You can discern. You can love people. You know also what's fruitful for them. You know what's fruitful for your children. You know what's fruitful for your adult children. Now that's a hard one. <laughs> Let it go. It's not fruitful for you. Don't get into that argument. It's going to damage that relationship. It's not fruitful for you. Let it go. Let it be. You are complete. You do not need to defend yourself. You are complete as a person. You are complete in Him. Keep your dignity. Do not lose you're cool. You are complete. And as you accumulate more and more of these decisions in which you choose life and you choose fruitfulness, you find yourself more complete, more mature in Him. Your suffering has purpose and it accomplishes the purposes and you're ready to understand Melchizedek does that make sense so you have to hurry up and catch up and next week we're going to study Melchizedek <laughs> ready or not here we come <laughs> you know this is a a great body of believers. I'm very proud of you because the one thing that people say about Sukkot is that you, you, you're very kind, 
You're very friendly. And I've seen many of you stick with relationships, forgive, overlook offenses, grow past those things. Receive correction. Wow. That's like way at the top nowadays. Nobody wants to receive correction from anybody. Without being offended. <laughs> Nobody wants to suffer. We talk so much about tolerance. Nobody wants to be tolerant. Forbearing. Just letting it go. That's what that means. Just let it go. Just let it go. Just let it go. You are complete. Amen. Let me pray for us.